Dr. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Dude, thanks for having me on. You got it. I think a good place to start is like, what do you think are the most common things that even people who have been lifting weights overlook when it comes to building muscle? I think a lot of people are missing an understanding of what good technique is like. A lot of other people are missing an understanding of how to tell if you got a good workout or not a good workout. A lot of people are missing an understanding of how to measure progress properly and how long it takes and what science to look for. A lot of people misunderstand how to adjust your plan once you have detected that your progress isn't as high as you would like to be. Like troubleshooting a plan seems to be pretty difficult for many people. Many people just kind of don't know where to start. And uh, of course, there's diet and recovery. Uh, those are important discussions. So I think a lot of people just, they're serious enough to go to the gym and to work really hard. And then when it comes to diet, many people aren't doing the kind of proper diet periodization, I guess I would say, diet phases and cycling those phases to really get like really awesome results. And I think some of those folks have a misunderstanding about how you are supposed to go about getting the results that you actually want because a huge fraction of people at the gym would really like to be muscular and lean at the same time. And many of them have trouble balancing those two goals and getting to a place where they're kind of a bit of both. And a lot of that's because they don't really understand how diet can take you there. And of course, a, a, another flaw that people have is misunderstanding the role of sleep and relaxation and recovery and rest and all those things. Because if you're a professional bodybuilder, for example, the most serious attempt you can make at, let's say, qualifying for the Mr. Olympia competition, which means you have to win a bodybuilding show. If you're interested in the most serious possible attempt at that, you're probably going to work very little or not at all in any kind of job, have almost no responsibilities. Just only make your training insanely difficult and then make the rest of your life profoundly easy. And that's how pro bodybuilders oftentimes do live, the best ones for sure. And that's how they should live. And then they get really, really amazing results. But you have other folks who read the magazines by the pros and look at the TikToks and Instas of the pros and watch them on YouTube. And uh, they, they're looking at rep ranges. They're looking at technique maybe. They're looking at like what kind of plan do you have put together. And uh, not understanding a lot of times that they have two jobs, three kids, one kid from another marriage, <laughs> and uh, three other hobbies, and somehow they're also trying to look a little bit more like a pro bodybuilder in there, that the fastest route to their ostensible goal of looking much more jacked and lean would be to back off of a ton of their responsibilities in life and really focus on providing more recovery and things like that. And not only is that overlooked, most people don't think you're supposed to be looking for it. <laughs> and they don't know how powerful rest and relaxation are as far as growing muscle. And they are very, very, very powerful. You, you brought up so many things. I, I think the thing that pops up to me is technique. A lot of people get that wrong in the gym. And it's not just as simple as just going in and just banging out reps in the gym. You have to really focus on what you're doing. So as you understand it, like what's the proper technique when it comes to lifting weights, when it comes to cadence, when it comes to form? I mean, I know there's variation depending on the exercise, but generally speaking, how do you, how do you assess that? So as far as good technique, I mean, there's a couple of basic principles you can employ in almost everything. One is you want to control all the phases of movement. It doesn't mean go slow. That means never really enter too many ballistic phases. And that's, you know, where like the object is moving free from any kind of external control. So that means on the way up, you know, you can go quite quickly, but in control, not so hard because gravity's pulling the other way. But on the way down in a movement in the eccentric phase, even if it's quick, you have to have some muscle activation to slow it down to some extent and don't just like drop the weights like crazy. So control is a big one and is the main prerequisite for technique for the rest of the discussion because if you don't have control, you can't employ any other technique variables. So control is number one. Another principle is that for most muscles, it seems, maybe all, as far as we can tell, a deep stretch is a really good stimulator of muscle growth. And so if you are benching some dumbbells and you're going halfway down to your chest, if you just went all the way down to your chest for a big deep stretch, you probably would just get better results. 
and the other big benefit of going super deep in a stretch is that you have to use less load to accomplish the same effect of internal force provision. And thus, you don't have to use the 100 pound dumbbells. Maybe you can use the 80s. And all of a sudden, your probability of joint connective tissue stress and injury declines substantially. And your accumulation of systemic fatigue, which is just all around tiredness from hauling heavy weights around, can also fall. And so you get more bang for the buck. So that's a big one is getting that real good, deep stretch. And then another element of technique is much more specific to the exercise, but can be proxied. And that's, is the exercise you're doing it and the way in which you're doing it, putting the target muscle as the limiting factor is exposing that target muscle to a lot of tension and proper position, or is that not really the case? So for example, people will train the barbell press or the dumbbell press uh, seated for their shoulders. And they say, this is for delts. But in reality, a vertical press is really for your anterior portion of your delts, your front delts, and your triceps, and really not much else. And so there is the side delt, which was much more prized than physique development and bodybuilding, much more often the limiting factor in a physique. And there's a real delt as well, and neither one of those get hit with shoulder pressing. So sometimes the exercise selection and how the exercise is done is just not really fit for purpose. Another one is if you're squatting, ostensibly squatting is for the quads, but if you sit really far back into a squat, as you sit down, you put the bar low on your back, you cut your depth, then you take a wider stance. The squats are now a better exercise for the adductors, for example, the good girl, bad girl muscle, and the lower back and the glutes than they are for the quads. So a lot of people will say, well, I'm doing 10 sets of quads every workout, but my quads aren't getting sore or pumped. And I look at what they're doing, I'm like, of, of course, yes, you're squatting wrong because you can squat in such a way that is mostly vertical and your knees get real far out in front of your toes and you go for a deep stretch and that really makes the quads a limiting factor and the main target of the exercise. So I see those are some of the pillars of really good technique. So is it, are you controlling the load? Are you getting a deep stretch? And is the exercise logically, biomechanically, remotely targeting the certain muscles that you want to train, at least with a high degree of stimulus, and ideally that they are such that they are the limiting factor? Like, if I'm trying to curl a dumbbell and I can't do it, it's probably because my biceps are the limiting factor, not some other muscle. But if it was some other muscle and I'm ostensibly training biceps, well, that's a real big problem because muscles grow best when you push them close to their limits. And if, you know, the reason I... Uh, for example, can't do any more pull downs for my back is because my grip is giving out because I didn't put on Versa grips or something like that. Then all of a sudden, I say, yeah, mechanically, it looks like my lats are the winning factor, but my grip gives out first. So someone's like, dude, I'm getting crazy pumps in my forearm. My grip is definitely failing on lat pull downs. We put some Versa grips on that person, they get like seven more reps per set. We you know it's a rough rule that three or four reps in reserve is where the effective, the, most of uh, the most effective growth will occur. And so you're, you're entirely skipping that range every single set if your forearms are limiting you so that it looks like it's good technique. It really actually isn't because it's never hitting your lats. So I say those those three are kind of, there's other considerations for sure, but those are three big pillars that I'll put it to you this way. If I walk into a gym and I see someone control the weight to some extent, I see them sink it deep into that muscle stretch position and biomechanically, like what they think they're targeting really is what they're targeting. I could have disagreements about the specific nature of that technique. I could give them ideas about how they could improve it. But as far as a yes or no, green check or red X, they get a green check for me. Fundamentally, man, that's all three things you have to do and right on. And there's so much diversity inside of that. But a lot of that diversity ends up being specific to the individual, the biomechanics, their anthropometry, and so on and so on. You talked about like leaving three or four reps in reserve, and you hear a lot about that when it comes to building muscle that you want to train to near failure. And, and, I, and you said like in the same conversation as things that get overlooked that it's like, are you pushing yourself? How do you know you're pushing yourself hard? How do you know that you're you know measuring progress in the right way? How does somebody know if they're actually training until near failure? Like how does somebody measure that? Probably the easiest way to do it is to go in one week. Ideally, in this case, you train a few times a week, every week, consistently. And it's to go in and all of your workouts, or even just one of your workouts, try to lift something with good technique, kind of for as many reps as you think you can. One of two things will happen during that lift. 
One is you'll quit at some point, but you might quit before the weight comes crashing down on you, or you might just have the weight come crashing down on you and then you quit. Generally, if the weight comes crashing down on you and you tried really, really hard, yeah, that's failure. Congratulations, you've succeeded. If you finish the rep, but you're sort of like, ah, I could have got maybe one or two more, but it really hurt and it really felt like it was dangerous, all valid points. Fine. Write down your reps that you did with the weight that you did. Next week, put five more pounds on the bar and do as many reps as before. Or if it's like a dumbbell, something you can't really change, and a change in weight would make it way huge fraction. Like if you're using 10 pounds for lateral raises, you can't just go to 15. That's like squatting 100 pounds and squatting 150. That's nuts. So what you can do is just add a rep. So you did sets of like 15 or so reps last time. Try sets of 16. If you keep week by week adding either five pounds or a repetition, eventually you must hit failure because going for an impossible goal eventually the goal becomes impossible unless you get stronger forever, which is amazing. Uh, unless, uh, so if, if the goal is impossible, you trying to achieve it, you will eventually hit muscular failure doing it or you quit. There's unfortunately no real insurance policy against just quitting. Like I'm legendarily not a person who trains very hard. And so I'll just quit before I get to failure because failure hurts and it scares me. And then there's no way I'm reaching failure. But if you have the mental fortitude to push ahead and you just don't know if you're pushing ahead, set yourself a challenge um, every week, it's a little tougher. Eventually, four, eight, 16, some odd weeks later, you're going to have a goal of 150 pounds on the leg press. And last week, you did 145 for 15 reps. This time, 150 pounds you do for 14. You try to come up on the 15th. The weight goes halfway up. It careens slowly back down. You get yourself out of the machine and go, holy, I couldn't do it. And then there you go. Now you know what failure feels like. When it comes to volume, each week, I feel like people kind of go back and forth on which split they should do, whether it's push-pull legs, whether it's one muscle group a day, whether it's total body, whether it's upper body, lower body. What have you found to be like the target volume for the average person to build muscle so that they can understand how to schedule their workout routines based on their schedule? Yeah, it really depends on how much of an inroad you want to make on your physique and how much time you have. Because if you want the most serious physique you could possibly have, I'd say training probably uh, eight to, to 12 times per week is a good idea. That means multiple daily sessions often, but that's a professional attempt at getting as big as you can. The next rung down is someone who's willing to train for like five days a week, because a lot of people are, you know, like young Wall Street guy has free time uh, Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, really needs to unplug. You know, he's still chasing tails, so he's got to look good and he's willing to put a lot of marbles into that sock. And so, you know, five days a week is a very reasonable thing to do. And there are a couple of splits that uh, can do that well. I'll talk about what the unifying characteristic of all those is in a second. And then lastly, you have like kind of maintenance, slow progress, or just getting started kind of split which is two to three days a week. You can get really good results two to three days a week, especially if there's like a part of your body you don't really care about. So for example, if you're like, look, I want it all. You're like, okay, including bigger forearms and calves, like real professional attempt, like yes. She whiz, you know, two times a week training for all those muscles. It's gonna be like, there's so many exercises. and so annoying. There's also like something eight general muscle groups in the human body and like could what are you going to do eight exercises in one session like it's a it's possible to include forearms and calves it's like 10 it gets a little crazy so when someone's like look like i want big chest big back big shoulders and arms my legs whatever just maintenance and then i don't care about my calves hey that's two or three days a week that's totally possible to do so that's as far as like scheduling what people's time commitments are for the kind of results they, they sort of seem to want and as far as uh, split design is concerned, you want to make sure that two things roughly happen. One is you're never leaving a muscle alone too long where it's not recovering or being trained because then it's like kind of missed opportunity for gains. So for example, say I write a program that trains my chest once a week. Reasonable amounts of volume, which I'll get to in a second per session, for most people will end up making your chest some combination of sore and too tired to have another ideal session of training happen to it for like half a week. 
And after that, your chest is pretty damn healed. It could be trained again. And it would be really, really great if it was. And then all of a sudden, you're just like waiting longer and kind of for no reason. And so it's almost a, a, a similar principle with, um, you know, how to serve people food at a nice restaurant if you're a good waiter. You don't want to jam the food in like right when they've just finished appetizers. You're like, boom, here's the main course. People have drinks. They want to chat a little bit. But also like if it's been 30 minutes since appetizers were finished by your table and there's no dinner, you kind of start to be like, is the guy dead back there somewhere? Did they forget we existed? So on the other side of that is the too soon thing. So you don't want to wait too long for muscles to have to recover because it's time you could have spent growing. But too soon is also a problem. If your muscles are still sore, if they're still very tired, that is they're very far off of what they could have in their kind of top end performance if you let them recover another day or two, it's also not a good idea to train them again right then and there. And so that's the idea, you know, at a restaurant of you're still just digging into your appetizers and they're like, all right, make room for the main course. And you're like, we're not even, what? what's going on? There's not any table space for this. It's going to degrade the experience of both the appetizer and the main course if, uh, you know, I, we're mixing the two together. And so if you trained legs on Monday and they're sore and tired and it calls for you to train legs again on Tuesday, you made a mistake. You know, you don't want to always be sore and tired for your training. It's just not ideal training. And so if we understand that muscles need to be trained pretty soon after they're recovered, but not any time much uh, shorter than that, we sort of arrive at most muscles for most people in most cases without some modifications can be trained like two to four times per week. So it's perfectly rational to have a whole body program Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for someone training four days a week, whole body every day, no problem. Four days a week uh, for each muscle, no problem. It's also possible to have like an upper, lower, upper, lower split where each muscle gets hit twice a week, but with more volume. And that kind of rounds out the discussion of how to manipulate volume and frequency. And so I can put some numbers to this finally. If you have to train the same muscle in your program the next day, Anywhere between one and three sets for that muscle, maybe one and four, is all you need and all you can recover from in order to productively hit it again the day after. So if I train my biceps on Monday with six sets, they're going to be cooked and Tuesday's stupid to train my biceps again. But if I train them with two to four sets, yeah, they feel quite good uh, on Tuesday and I can have another productive session. So per session volume can be sort of two to four sets if it's you training every muscle every day, every time you train. If you give muscles a third of the week or half a week to recover, it's more like five to eight working sets per muscle seems to be closer to the ideal volume in most cases for most people. So if I train my back Monday and my back Thursday, I might be able to do eight sets Monday and eight sets Thursday, and that'll be awesome. A little bit more growth per session because it's more volume, but the sessions aren't just frequent. So you get very similar growth between training something twice a week and four times a week. You just have to make sure it recovers by the time you train it, but doesn't re stay recovered for uh, days and days where you could be training it productively again. And so when it comes to like exercise selection, I mean, I've heard you talk that there's just so much nuance about it and that, you know, in reality, it's just important to just make sure that you are just, you know, training hard, et cetera. But I think people often get confused. They're like, all right, should I use dumbbells? Should I use machines? Should I use bands? Like, what should I use? Like, what have you found, generally speaking, to be the most like effective types of exercises for each muscle group? So there's a way to find out what the most effective exercises are. And that's to track your own ratio of stimulus to fatigue that you can proxy off of an exercise. So if an exercise or lets you really feel the tension in the target muscle. Like you try to do some dumbbell flies and it just rips your chest open. You're like, okay, this is pretty good. No one's going to tell me this is a bad exercise for chest unless it injures me also or something like that. If you feel a really deep burn in the target muscle, that's another good sign. If you get a big pump, that's another sign. If the muscle gets really weak after training, that's another sign. Like if your uh, cup in your cup holder in your car feels heavy after you train biceps, like, yeah, man, you probably did some of those. Some of those exercises had to have hit your biceps because holy crap, you're so weak. You have trouble lifting a, a, you know, a cup in your car. 
And, uh, you know, if, if you get soreness, that's a pretty good sign that something's going on. You do a couple sets of dips and your triceps get crazy sore the next day. It's, it's unreasonable for someone to tell you dips are not at least in the conversation for an effective tricep exercise. But that's where individualization comes in. Some people may do one machine and be like, meh, it didn't really do much. Some people may do that same machine, different person, and be like, holy crap, that lit my ass up. And so it really is a really individual, but that's just the stimulus side. Then there's the fatigue side of how are my joints and connective tissues doing here? Because I could put you on a leg press machine that you're like, my knees and back would both hurt at the same time. What an accomplishment. Whereas another leg press machine or a free squat or dumbbell lunge, you could be like, oh my God, my knees and lower back feel great, but my quads get kind of equally stimulated from both. Well, probably not rocket science to figure out that like you probably should do the thing that also doesn't hurt you. You know what I mean? It's you know, it's like having a a girlfriend that's like amazing in bed, but also gets stabby every now and again. You know, if she just got less stabby less often and threatened your life while you slept less often, maybe we could say find a girl's also pretty good in bed, but maybe does doesn't do crazy all the time. So we don't want to just look at stimulus. We want to look at stimulus and fatigue. So joints and connective tissue is important. Another one is how much an exercise beats you up systemically. And that's like, you know, you get done doing deadlifts and your back gets a really good stimulus, but you're just so damn tired. I mean, it ruins the rest of the day. It ruins, it makes you tired the rest of the day. It actually interferes with your next workout the day after. And the results are pretty good. But then you try some bent over rows and you're like, dude, honestly, that that hits my back up better for pump and, and soreness and, and fatigue and all those things. But the rest of me seems quite fine. So some exercises have a systemic fatigue component that's just so high, it becomes less tenable to do them. So that's kind of a cheat sheet as to how to find your own best exercises. And the big thing there is a principle of variation states that if you do the same exercises over and over for some number of weeks and often months, eventually the stimulus you get out of them starts to decline and the fatigue you get out of it starts to increase. And so the stimulus to fatigue ratio of any given exercise starts to suck. And then it's probably good for you to go find some replacement exercises to try instead of it. And the good news is it refreshes. So a few months, a few weeks later, you go back to that old exercise and it feels right as rain again. And, and, and that means that people looking for the optimum exercise can possibly be doing that more than for a few months at a time at best, maybe a year if you're a beginner, that there's always has to be a what I call a candidacy group of your best exercises, the ones that seem to cause the best stimulus and the least fatigue on average. But you draw one of those out for too long and it's going to start to suck. It's kind of like when people say, well, what's your favorite food? And so for me, uh, I would say it's the chicken pasta broccoli bake from the store. It's like a TV dinner. Not a joke, by the way. It's amazing. It's my favorite tasting food basically of all time. And someone would say like, oh, so that's the food you want to eat every day. And I'd be like, yeah, like about five days in, I'd be like, I don't want to eat this anymore. It's stale on me. It's the same thing with exercises. People say, you know, you, you, what are your go-to exercises? I'm like, I only have five or 10 in each category that are quite great. And then so dumbbells are great, uh, free weight barbell moves are great, Smith machine is great, regular machines are great, cables are great. Bands aren't as good because remember earlier I said like a deep stretch to the muscle is like kind of very stimulative more than like the top end portion. The problem with bands is if you use bands to curl, for example, at the very bottom, they just don't pull much. At the very top, they pull the most. It's actually flipping the force curve you want to optimize hypertrophy. Does that mean bands are terrible? No. Are they still effective on the margins for hypertrophy? Yes, absolutely. Any form of resistance training is, but they're not going to be ideal. And a beginner may get some very good results from band training. An advanced person may get no results at all from band training, and it would just be good enough to keep their muscle on their body. Oh, what a tragedy. You train for six months really hard using bands. You don't have anything to show for it. So bands are okay, but probably kind of uh, the least in that pack. And then I'd say another pr principle for good exercise selection is also stability. If you're going to get an exercise that you're stable with, especially feet on the ground stable, um, then you can generate a lot of force. Your body will let you generate a lot of force and thus stimulate a lot of muscle growth if you feel stable. If you're very unstable, your body actually caps your force production for you subconsciously. And then you just can't really grow big muscles because you're so worried about balance all the time, your body's a safety mechanism. So, you know, squatting on like a BOSU ball or something like that, it's just real dumb. 
because you're doing like 60% of your weight you could lift potentially for the same number of reps as 40% higher weight would be lifted, which means as far as stimulating muscle growth, you're like not really even in the conversation for that anymore, especially as an intermediate and above. So it's these stable exercises that meet all the check marks if have a good stimulus and low fatigue, that's probably a really good go-to. You'll hear people say that people should favor compound movements when it comes to building strength and, and, and building muscle. Like I know there's a lot of individualization like you just mentioned, but do you think that people should still try to focus on those as much as possible? No, uh, but there are some good reasons to use them. One good reason is they transfer to general health and athletic performance better to daily life. If I got you stronger doing squats versus leg extensions, you may have similarly sized quads, but if you have to pick someone up who passed out on the street and you have to put them in a taxi cab or you have to go to Home Depot and take some gigantic, awful, terrible thing off the shelf to put it in your giant cart, um, or you play rugby on the weekends and you want to be able to still you know, jostle a few teeth when you hit someone, then compound movements transfer best to real life. Another thing about compound movements is there's actually, I've sort of categorized myself kind of two kinds of compound movements. Compound movements are just movements that use uh, more than one joint to generate uh, you know, a range of motion. And so the kind of two extremes of compound movement are two types. One are uh, compound movements that uh, really uh, do in fact use multiple joints, but they're so focused on one muscle that they're really one muscle at a time compound movements. So for example, wide grip bench pressing is technically compound movement for sure. It uses your shoulders and elbows to generate movement, but really it's your pecs doing most of the work and being the way, way limiting factors. Your triceps get some kind of stimulus, but it's not much because it's not at a deep stretch to the tricep and there's a very small range of motion for that muscle and the pec is really getting the most stretch out of the movement. So wide grip bench presses would be a compound, but still function largely like an isolation in the fact that there's one mus muscle that's really the target and absorbing most of the stimulus. Whereas a, a, an exercise like a closer grip bench, close grip bench, it targets the chest quite a bit, but also targets the triceps a lot and the front delts. So there's really three muscles as opposed to one or two that the close grip bench robustly trains. And so if you're a person with relatively limited time, you want the best bang for your buck, you want all around hypertrophy, you don't want to spend hours and hours and hours in the gym, those more uh, distributed compounds, ones a compound lifts like the close grip bench, like the underhand close grip row or pull up that train multiple muscles hard at the same time, they're a better bet than isolations because imagine two programs. In one program, I do four sets of close grip bench and I move on to my other parts of the body. I just robustly stimulated muscle growth in my pecs, my front delts, and my triceps. Four sets. Now imagine if I broke all those up into isolations. I do pec flies for the pecs, front raises for the shoulders, and cable extensions for the triceps. That's 12 sets to, to get probably a little bit more hypertrophy. Maybe we could say in eight or nine total sets we would get uh, the same hypertrophy as four sets of close grip bench. I mean, look, Doug, you got, you got, you got an extra five sets of time lying around everywhere. Uh, some people don't. And so compounds aren't somehow magically better at putting muscle on your body. That's not true. They're definitely not magically better for making you stronger because most strength is tested in a compound manner. The deadlift is a compound lift. Picking something off the ground is a compound lift. So you might as well train how you perform. And so, yes, they're better for strength. Most people don't really need any more strength than they have already in their day-to-day -day life. But compounds, especially the distributed ones that hit many muscles well at the same time, they do really save a ton of time for people looking for the best results and not wanting to like you know have to have every single muscle trained with isolation movements, which is annoying as hell. I've heard you say that people will often at times rest, you know, too long just because they're trying to fit the prescribed, you know, set um, prescription that some people may say for strength. Like, what is your like recommended protocol for assessing how long you should rest in between sets, um, depending on what you're working? It depends on what kind of program you're running. If it's a strength program with your reps pre-filled for you, like you need three sets of three at this weight. You really do need to rest as long as it takes to get another set of three. And then that could be some amount of time you're not really interested in resting. But because strength is so dependent 
strength training is so dependent on you trying really hard each set, uh, it's worth the time to rest a long time. One thing you'll notice if you go to a weightlifting training hall or a powerlifting training hall, and this is a con- joke I make quite often, is if aliens observed, knowing nothing about our culture or anything like that, what weightlifters and powerlifters do, and you ask them to talk about it, they say, well, is it mostly sit down? Occasionally, they'll do this lift thing, but I don't think that's a big part of what they're doing there because it's only like 5% of their time spent in the gym. The other 95%, they're just sitting down. So I think the gym is a place where people like to sit down, maybe distract themselves with some lifting every now and again. And so, you know, uh, yeah, you need to rest a long time for strength. If I hypertrophy the story is a, a little bit uh, different. In hypertrophy training, you need to be able to train as hard as possible, um, but you also need rest to make every set very hard. And the real question becomes, what is enough rest to be able to say, okay, I'm going hard enough in my next set to make it worthwhile for me to start the set versus just to wait longer and make the set a higher quality. So we typically look for like four factors to checklist. As soon as you've checklisted them, you pretty reasonably can start doing another set that'll be worth your time. One is that your cardiorespiratory system can't be a limiting factor for the next set. So if you're still breathing heavy as hell, it's probably not a good idea to start your next set of leg presses because then you'll, your breathing will probably limit you on that next set and the target muscle won't itself be driven close to failure. And then you have a problem because if the target muscle isn't driven close to failure, it's not exactly your best attempt at getting uh, jacked right there. So that next set's not going to be high quality. Another one is kind of neural slash psychological strength perception. If you are deadlifting or or benching or curling, after you put the weight down, you feel this like, ugh, kind of feeling, you know, where you're like, oh my God, I'm beat. That was tough. And if someone's like, all right, do another hard set right now, five seconds after you put the weight down, you're like, dude, holy, like, even if I'm not breathing heavy, like my mind's just not right. Like I just tried really, really hard. I'm not about to do that right, right away. But after a few seconds, few minutes, you start to feel your swag again. You get more confidence back and you feel strong and you're like, damn, I really could push another set. So when you feel ready to do another hard set, that's another big deal. So cardio, you're feeling ready to do another set. Another one is, are your synergistic muscles recovered? So for example, if you're doing squats for your quads, but your lower back is still really, really burning, you can try to do another set, and if it's too soon, your lower back is going to be the thing that makes you quit the next set. So your quads aren't even a limiting factor anymore, it's just your lower back. So you have to make sure your synergists are ready and good to go. And then lastly, there's a certain thing about sets for hypertrophy that if it's too few repetitions, technically each rep grows muscle, but you have to do so many sets to make up for the low reps that it's just annoying and impractical. And basically anything over about five reps per set generally seems to be like, okay, that's enough reps to include in a set for it to be generally like very muscle growth promoting. And then if it's more reps or fewer reps, uh, you know, anywhere from five to 30 repetitions generally causes roughly similar muscle growth results. So how you know it's time to start doing the next set is first, if the next set is predicted to do more than five reps. So for example, if you do a a set of six in the squat and you rest like two seconds and you do a set of one, and then you fail. Well, a set of one, gee whiz, were you really going to do five of those to just make another one set's worth of muscle growth? Are you going to do another six times from one? That's nuts. That's crazy. Like You'll be there all day. So maybe if you rest for longer, and then in the next set of squats, get five squats, then hey, that's another really hard set to potentiate hypertrophy. And then if you have rep ranges, you say, you know, for me, sets of 15 to 20 really seem to feel best on lat pull downs. You just did a set of 19, rest as long as it takes to get somewhere between 15 and 20. If you really think that rep range is best for you, then you can rest long enough to get into that. And that's going to require some out of auto regulation, some fine tuning, some experimentation. But generally, you'll have a system where you kind of know what's going on at the end. And you're like, okay, roughly two minutes seems to be good for me for lat pull downs. So if you can check all those four boxes, after you can check them in your head, we know from a scientific perspective that, yes, you're probably going to have another really effective set if you choose to do another set again. If you wait, your next set will be even more effective, even more effective. But time is linear, and the effectiveness improvement of waiting after the four factors have been checkboxed 
is, I suppose, like hyperbolic in the sense that it decays really, really rapidly at the front end and then not much happens later. So if I don't check the four factor rest model, my cardio is still and I'm not even feeling strong yet, and I train again before I start, then, uh, oh, sorry, I train again before I'm feeling good, I might only get 50% of my potential theoretical muscle growth out of that next set because I waited way too little time. But once the four-factor rest bottle is checked off, we're talking about hitting at least 80, probably 90 plus percent right there. You're ready to do it again. And if you wait another eight minutes, now you might be back to 99% of effectiveness. But hold on a second. If from a minute and a half rest, you got back up to 90, is it really worth you waiting another eight minutes to get to 99? Remember, we're filling the cup. So if we rest if we, our set takes 30 seconds, okay, that's two minutes total. We rest another minute and a half, that's three and a half minutes. We hit another set, that's four minutes. We've now hit three sets in four minutes where the person who's resting for eight minutes to get another 99% is still gonna wait another four minutes to even hit their second set to, to not even tie us. We already have more hypertrophic yield stimulated to the muscles in four minutes than a person waiting eight minutes has after eight minutes of waiting, and now he's just starting to get into sets. If the set takes 30 seconds, even after 8.30, as a matter of fact, because he's wait, resting another eight minutes after that, 16 minutes and 30 seconds later into their workout, they still haven't had as much hypertrophic stimulus as we had in, well, you know, if you count that first set, four minutes and 30 seconds. Man, that starts to build a really compelling case. You know, it's, it's a similar exponential problem to how expensive it is for you to clean your room to a certain degree of cleanliness. If you want 90% clean, you vacuum, you put away all the crap, you throw it away, you put all the clothes where they're supposed to be, fold it up, there's 90%, it took you an hour. If you want 99.9%, .9%, I mean, you need industrial cleaning chemicals, you need to move the bed and the dresser, you need to move everything, that's a day. If you want 99.9%, .9 you need to get a crew in. It's gonna cost them a week of work and you $1,000. So a lot of times people say, I rest longer to feel better on my next set. They forget to include the fact that like, is it really worth you spending another triple your time in the gym for a, an amount of stimulative soda in the cup that you could have filled just by resting a little longer and just doing a few more reps? And so that four-factor rest model for most people that are sensitive to their time constraints, as soon as you hit it, you can just go do that next set and you're missing almost nothing. One thing people will often do to save time and to limit their rest is superset. When do you think supersetting makes sense and how can you do it in a way that doesn't limit your muscle growth? There are two kinds of supersets. There's agonist supersets and unrelated muscle supersets. Agonist supersets means the same muscle getting stimulated. So for example, I do cable tricep pushdowns and my triceps are already very fatigued, very close to failure. And without much rest or any rest at all, I do flat dumbbell presses where again, my triceps are instantly the limiting factor and are again driven very close to failure. As a matter of fact, they're always close to failure through that second set. It's a great technique, probably not to save time, but to drive a really high degree of stimulus into one muscle, using the opportunity that's already pre-exhausted and thus close to failure to drive it close to failure again with minimal amount of load and repetition. Mostly people who are in experiencing trouble growing a muscle or really kind of full send into advanced hypertrophy, we'll be using those kinds of supersets. The other kind of supersets are unrelated muscle supersets, and that's when you do a set of squats and then you do a set of pull-ups right after, and then you rest 30 seconds and maybe you repeat the process. Those supersets, none of the muscles, the major ones that you're using in the squat are you using in the pull-up. So while your legs are recovering, you're doing pull-ups and stimulating your back and biceps and rear delts. 30 seconds later, you start training legs again, your biceps and back and rear delts aren't fully recovered, but during the time that you're doing squats, they are recovering to some extent. And so by doing that, you can save an unbelievable amount of time and still get a very good stimulus. Now, for a professional attempt at building muscle, I'd say that's still a little bit subpar because to have the highest quality leg workout possible, the only thing you need to be doing between sets of squats is resting, just sitting there, walking around, pacing a little bit, lying down, drinking some drinks, whatever it takes to get you back up to high performance. Because if you do something right after your squat set, a lot of times it's just the performance on both exercises really rapidly degrades. If you're really big, if you're really strong, if the exercises are systemically taxing. But if you're a person who's going for a body that is you know, uh, healthy, 
very well, very fit, uh, sexually very appealing, pretty jacked. You can get that body in two or three hours a day, or a day, good God, two or three hours per week total of training by using unrelated supersets and stacking exercises together so that you've done kind of, you know, six exercises or sorry, six attempts at an exercise, you know, four sets of each one, but each one's a superset. So you really have trained 12 muscles or muscle groups during that time in a time that would normally take someone to train six. So with an hour on Monday, an hour on Wednesday, an hour on Friday, a full body, uh, unrelated supersetting, you can nuke your whole body, no problem, and have a physique and a level of health and a level of aesthetics and strength that most people think is like, oh, but you're clearly addicted to fitness and you're obviously spending just hours and hours a day doing this. And that's not even close. If you are ultra elite, you want your biggest possible muscles, I would say in most cases, unrelated muscle supersetting just isn't going to work all that well. So for example, if I can do 20 reps with the 30 pound dumbbells on lateral raises on a bench and I can squat, you know, 500 for a set of 10. If I squat 500 for 10, as soon as I get off that and I go do lateral raises, I'm getting the 30s for five and then I'm throwing up all over myself. There is no supersetting happening. I did each exercise at this point when you're very muscular, very advanced, takes so much out of you, you probably need the rest. But if you're a beginner or intermediate, and especially if your goals in fitness is just basically to have like a real sexy body, which I never got, and believe it, I, I every day I pray for it, never never comes, uh, then you can definitely do that with those unrelated supersets. And I'll even put a finer point on it. I think the vast majority of people who come to the gym to try to get that healthy, hot body should be training with unrelated supersets 90% of the time. And I think when their trainers don't train them like that, it's a bit of a ripoff. So for example, my uh, colleague at uh, RP, uh, 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 Nick Shaw and myself, when we came up in fitness in New York about 15 years ago, we noticed that um, a lot of trainers were charging people a lot of money and then like getting them on the cable and having them do like rear delt crossover flies. And it's like, this is a 45 year old woman who trains twice a week. Why are we targeting her rear delt, which is the size of like one of my forefingers? Can't we have her do a compound movement to target that and her biceps and her back? Is like, okay, great. Yes, we can. And then why is she resting for three minutes between sets? Can't we get her to do some other muscle she didn't just train? Which, by the way, adds a crazy cardio and calorie burning benefit. It's fun. You're out of breath and improves your cardiovascular fitness and your health even more. It's just all right answers. So I think most personal trainers in the US in the world for people that don't have professional or really exotic aspirations for the physique that just want a healthy, happy uh, uh, physique people may be interested in having sex with, then uh, that's probably the best way to train by a mile. So for these full body workouts, how many sets per workout should they do? I mean, I mean you mentioned the pull-ups and then the squats, and I would assume it could be like a bench and then lunge shoulder press and like an RDL? Is that how you would kind of program it? Something like that? Yeah, totally. And so it depends on like what your split is, because if you have upper lower split, you can do only upper movements one day and only lower. And thus you can do lots of stuff. Um, so the number of exercises can change based. If it's whole body, you might have to do a few more exercises to do that. So those are some questions. Another one is, where are you in your fitness journey? If you are a beginner, you've never trained before, you know, just three total pairings, six total exercises, one set of each is your first workout. And that's whole body. And then you repeat that half a week later and you train two times a week for a month or two. You're going to get great results. After a few weeks, you're going to say, you know, this one set of each really isn't that hard anymore. Increase to two. And then after about 12 to 16 weeks training twice a week, you'll be up to 20 total sets per workout, maybe, uh, maybe even 25. And you're like, oh, this feels challenging, but great. You're going to have great results. And you say, yeah, I could be doing more though, and I want to do more. Then you increase to three days a week, work up from 10 total sets all the way up to 20 total sets per workout, and kind of repeat that cycle until you feel like, oh, this is really great and sustainable, or I need a new challenge. And then you probably add another session for the week, four sessions and so on and so forth. When it comes to exercises, I mean, what, what do you think is the most underrated exercise as far as um, like bang for the buck? Bang for the buck. Underrated exercise. <laughs> I'm always curious about these questions as I don't know of any rating committee that does this. I wonder how we aggregate ratings. Um, 
so I'd say the 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 clean and squat to press is it highly over, uh, underrated for uh, being a great full body exercise. I mean, the clean portion works most of your back and it works a lot of your posterior chain and your glutes. The squat portion works more or less your entire lower body, uh, especially the pushing muscles they're in. And then the press afterwards works a lot of your pushing muscles. So if you combine that with a few other exercises, I mean, this is an exercise that takes care of like 80% of your body. Very few people do it outside of CrossFit. CrossFitters do it all the time because they decided to just run right into the challenge uh, box head first, which is awesome. And they do get great results for that reason. But CrossFit doesn't look easy. And so a lot of people in the gym have this other problem where they come to the gym, they want some results, but they tend to choose styles of training, exercises, modalities, pacing. This is not very hard. And it's nice. It's not very hard. It doesn't feel very bad. But it kind of doesn't get them the results they want. Or they're like, oh, man, I'd have to spend six hours in the gym every week getting the body I want. It's like, no, actually, Betty, it's still three, but you'd have to turn up the intensity. You don't train hard, which is why. It's like if someone you know, eats eats a bite of food. If you've ever eaten around children, you know, they eat a bite of food every 15 minutes. And they're like, it's going to take me two hours to finish this. Like, yeah, maybe you could take a bite of food every minute, and then it won't. So same idea with adult fitness. So like, you can go harder and... Uh, just there's just not a lot of regular people at the gym who are going to try to do uh, you know clean and press because the first rep you're like this sucks. How many people do burpees at the gym? Just regular burpees are great exercise. But, oh my god, it's awful! I have to jump around. I got to get all the way on the ground. I'm going to let my CrossFit instructor help me with these, and that's why CrossFit's actually a great thing for regular people to get fit with because they will make you do you do not want to do, and it will get you into shape so long as you don't know, break into pieces or quit. A lot of people spend so much time warming up and trying to stretch and get ready before they lift. I've heard you take sort of a controversial approach on this, but when I heard it, I was like, oh, that makes sense. It's kind of what I do. Like, I'm not the person who warms up. I go in and I just get right into it. And I'm like, I pray I don't like tear my my rotator cuff when I'm loading up the bench, but I've also been training for a while. So I guess I know my body a bit more, but for the average person, what should their warm up look like? If you're training in normal temperature conditions and your body's already at a normal temperature when you walk into the gym, then what you really can do is do put like your 30 rep max on the bar, do a set of 12 with it, put your 20 rep max on the bar and after a minute or two of rest, do a set of eight with it, put your 10 rep max on the bar, do a set of four with it, and then rest another minute or two, and then you're ready to do your regular lifts for that muscle group. And with muscle groups that are not that muscle group, you can do a couple warm-up sets or just one b before you go next. So if for chest, just that warm-up is good, but then your next chest exercise, you can go right into work sets. So you can do like one easy set of five, feel out the weight and go. So that's a really good strategy. If you are very cold physically, or if the gym you train in is quite cold, then I would recommend uh, a brisk five-minute incline walk or jog or elliptical run to get your core body temperature to where you just barely start to sweat. And then your internal temperature and joint temperatures are good enough to prevent injury largely and to give you a high level of performance. In most cases, it's just not required. You know, like as soon as I'm walking off the street, getting into my gym, I go to the locker room, I take my coat off, I put it in there. I'm already sweating. So sweet. I'm just going to go right into what's called specific warm ups, whichever exercises first. 12, 8, 4, begin. But if, you know, you train in Alaska and your gym is powered by one heater off to the side and there's 2,500 square feet of space to the other side um, and you come in brutally cold, yeah, you're going to want to warm your whole body up before you do anything crazy because cold tissues do have a higher propensity to experience injury. And that's a stupid way to get hurt. Do you think that doing the the one muscle group per day, like the old school bodybuilding split, do you think that can be still effective if you're you know hitting it hard and doing the proper amount of sets that we've been discussing yeah the two things on that one it can be effective but there are differential degrees of effect and it may be important to you to get higher effect like um both the russian and united states militaries are effective in the technical sense uh, but the American military is effective by a factor of 100 more. So when push comes to shove, you're Russia, you don't want to fight the U.S. because you lose that battle. So there, yeah, if you can get very large muscles by training everything once a week, just dedicated its own day, but it's not very nice consolation when you take third at your bodybuilding show and the guy that took first trains muscles more often than you do. So that's the first thing. Second thing is 
some muscles, because of their size and their design and their exposure to tension, just take longer to heal from your average workout than other muscles. And so if I have really large pecs and I do really hardcore movements and I do a lot of them, I get really sore pecs. It might take five days for my pecs to heal. And then seven days later when I train them again, well, I only spent two days not training hard. No big deal. Five out of seven is pretty good. So pecs and quads and glutes and the back, it can take a while to heal. So it's okay to train them once a week. And also you're going to be so well recovered by next time, you're going to train real hard every single time, which is great. But side delts, biceps, oftentimes triceps, forearms, calves, I mean, these muscles are profoundly difficult to really get sore and tired for longer than half a week, often longer than a few days. And so if someone's like, yeah, man, like one of my favorite sort of comedy things that I hear at the gym is shoulder day. Like your side delts take a week to heal? Well, they might take two days to heal. There's no way that anyone who's training side delts once a week is going to get better side delt growth than someone who just trains them twice a week, often just by doubling the volume. That's how far away you are from pushing yourself to your limit. It's, it's almost like if someone who's just kind of a wuss 17 years old, you're like, okay, uh, try wrestling this person who's an instructor or try. So what their level of trying is, you compare that to someone who's a Navy SEAL, they're going to be like, you don't even know how to know how to know how to start to ask the question of how to try hard. <laughs> you uh, Trust me, you're not trying hard. You think you are, but you're not. And so to me, training delts and biceps and forearms and some other muscles just once a week isn't trying your hardest by any measure. This you will get much better gains if you train that muscle more frequently. So when Ronnie Coleman trains his chest, I believe that it takes a week for it to heal. Though even Ronnie trained every muscle twice a week, hilariously. Bad example on my part. But with muscles that are smaller and recover quicker, it's a difficult, is it effective still to, to train once a week? Yes. Is it anywhere close to the most effective? Not even by a million. And if you want your best physique results, what I recommend is the following. Don't constrain yourself to the week. Start training each muscle with a, a good bit of training, enough to make you tired and sore. You start observing how often each muscle roughly takes to heal to where it's prepared to train again. For some muscles, that could be once a week. For many, it'll be twice a week. For some, it's three times a week and even four times a week. And go from there and design a program based on your needs. Some people have trained biceps three times a week, but then reduced it to twice a week and noticed they're getting much more complete recovery. Twice a week blew up their biceps because three times was too much. But the opposite story is more often the case where you're training back once a week and you're like, bro, I'm having trouble getting back size. And someone's like, dude, train twice a week. Like, no way. Like, well, you recovered by Thursday if you train back Monday. And they're like, guess I'll try to find out. They go in Thursday, amazing back workout, go again next Monday, amazing again. We just doubled your work and probably 1.75 extra gains simply because you were healing so far on time. Uh, one more thing to add here is the week is entirely a human construct. You could be going to an alien planet where they're like, oh, our week is 57 days long. And you're like, all right, Mike Menser time, time to train once my chest once every 57 days. You never do that. So muscles don't know how many days you've spent relaxing. They just have their recovery curves. They don't know about the Gregorian calendar. They don't know about the week. So saying just once a week is cool for convenience purposes. It may be close to the right answer in some cases, but just really far from the right answer in many others. And I mean, you're trying to gain muscle, you're trying to get jacked, you don't have to say only once a week. It's arbitrary from the beginning. You've mentioned a few times in our conversation about paying attention to how sore you are and how that relates to like how your body responds to certain exercises or certain workouts. I mean, I've heard over the over recent years that being sore doesn't necessarily mean you had a great workout. Like, what are your thoughts on that? So I think the, the claim that being that, that being sore means you didn't have a great workout is categorically false in essentially every case. Because when your muscles have delayed onset muscular soreness, that means you went above and beyond their proximate ability to maintain tissue integrity, and they needed the immune system to come in and re-architect the muscle and heal it all it broken inside. That's what soreness is. Now, does that mean your goal every time has to be soreness? No. Is it even true to say that maximum soreness equals maximum gains? No. It means maximum stimulus driven to the muscle, but that much stimulus can make so much damage that your body fixes the damage half the time or all the time and doesn't even get to growing you much 
or at all. So it's definitely such a thing as being too sore. But if you are getting sore, you're definitely stimulating the muscle robustly. And that's a good thing to know if you're not making gains. So for example, if your shoulders never get sore, but you're making great gains on your shoulder strength and size, no problem. Nobody asked, nobody answered. Keep doing what you're doing. But if your shoulders never get sore and you're really struggling to put on shoulder size, you have to ask yourself the philosophical question of, am I training my shoulders hard enough? And someone could say like, well, are you getting sore? Like, no. Well, how do you know you're going hard enough? At some level of difficulty, at some level of intra-session stimulus magnitude, most people will experience delayed onset muscle soreness in that muscle. And that may even be too much, but it sure is not not enough. So if someone's like, Dan, and eight sets of squats make me sore as hell, I know something about them that's very, very unique and very special and very useful. It's that for them, eight sets of squats is at least enough to cause a robust stimulus. And so doing more is probably not a good idea. Here's how I use this in context. Someone tells me, look, man, like I'm really having trouble bringing up my glutes. Like, okay, when you train your glutes, do they get sore? They're like, yep, every single time. And I, are you recovered for your next workout? They're like, yep, just barely, then recovered, then I'm training. Anything I'm going to tell them after that is not going to be to try to improve the stimulus side of the equation. It's going to be trying to improve the recovery side of the equation. You got to eat more. How much are you eating? They're like, well, I really haven't gained weight in a few months. Do you expect your glutes to grow if you physically don't provide raw materials, right? Like if you're building a skyscraper in New York and the port authority is like, you can't import any new materials. You're like, I don't care how long the workers are working. They're not building anything. There's no materials here. But I sure wouldn't tell them like, hey, listen, like you got to go harder. Harder? But they're already getting sore and they're barely recovering. Any attempt at going harder is just interfering more and more with hypertrophy because it's causing so much damage. It's just counterproductive. So soreness is a real good way to see that you're for sure doing enough. For that, it's great. And if you are experiencing poor gains in a muscle, your nutrition is dialed in, recovery is dialed in, and you seem to be like, I think, I think I'm not doing enough and you haven't gotten sore yet. Up you go, slowly increase your volume over time, see if you can get sore, at least really fatigued, and you'll probably catch some growth along the way. If you're not getting sore, but your progress is really great, don't worry about soreness. It, it probably wouldn't benefit you a ton to do more because you're already getting great results. Just keep doing what you're doing. So you've said a couple of things, like when it comes to like, if people aren't seeing results, it's, it's likely a factor of this. They're not, you know, working out intensely enough. They're not eating enough. They're not recovering enough. What do you say, like, generally speaking, like, if you if you pulled like 100 of the people who have come to you over the years, like, what is it typically that they're not doing in the gym? Is it intensity? Consistency by a long shot. People will say, I've been training for four weeks. Like, I'm usually on and off. I haven't trained in eight weeks and really want to improve my chest. I'm like, this is nice. Come to me when you've trained regularly for a year. And if they do, they're like, hey, my chest gains have been great. I'm like, that's right. Training consistently makes your chest get bigger, you know, like that's a big one um, in the gym. There's tons of ones outside the gym that I could talk about, but in the gym, that's a big one. Another one is very, very bad exercise selection um, or, or really, really bad technique. So some people want bigger legs, but they're unwilling to squat leg press or hack squat deep. And like, yeah, it's really hard to grow your legs if you only half squat. You have to do double the volume and it beats up your back and you might still get not so great gains. So that's a big problem. Uh, and then, you know, the, uh, so the technique one is bad. Uh, and, the, and then, of course, you know, some people think that some exercises are definitely really good for a muscle group when, in fact, they're not that great. So they'll do sumo squats halfway down for the glutes. And their glutes aren't growing much. Well, there are movements that are way better for your glutes, like the front foot elevated lunge. is just way more stimulative for your glutes than that exercise. So a lot of times the exercises they're choosing aren't exactly the ones that challenge the muscle uh, enough. And obviously, in, in some people, it's a matter of effort. And in many people, it's a matter of volume. And by effort, I mean, like, they're just not pushing every set really that, that close to failure. And there's a volume question of, like, you know, like, your muscles could recover from 30 work sets. Uh, your biceps could recover from 30 working sets per week, but you're doing 10. And for some people, their genetics are such that they don't grow very well unless they do much more volume. And then so for them, doing more like 15 or 20 or 25 sets, they'd see better gains. But a lot of them try that and they're like, but that's a lot of work. And I'm like, well, 
You were never entitled to being super jacked, unfortunately, that God did not sign for that package in your case. So you're going to have to earn it. Um, I will say, though, maybe tragically or whatever it is, two other things I have to mention. And I have to mention it would be nice maybe for your for your listeners to hear. A lot of times, the kind of gains people want are just limited by their genetics and their age. I mean, you know, I've had many times 48-year-old women come to me and uh, they're like, I want like a bikini body with like even more muscle than a bikini athlete. And it turns out their genetics just aren't that great for building muscle. Obviously, they're females, their hormonal environment's not ideal at all for building muscle. The 48 years old, they have some pre-existing injuries. Their body's not as responsive as it used to be. And so all of a sudden, they're not in a position to be gaining a lot of muscle to begin with. And a lot of these folks, they're smart, very well-meaning, very diligent folks. And they go, okay, this must be the secret that I'm missing that's not allowing me to get jacked. And they'll point to a 26-year-old bikini competitor on steroids in a magazine or in an Instagram post to be like, how do I look like her? Well, you know, Karen, there's no real path for your genetics at 48 years old to get there unless we're going to fuel you up with so many drugs. You'll have to change your name to Jim after a while because you're going to have a receding hairline and so on and so forth. So a lot of times uh, when people don't get the results they want, Sometimes it's a good idea to come back and see if it, their aspirations are grounded in any bit of realism. And the best way I talk about getting results is do a reasonable program that gets you some level of results. And then just try to keep getting that kind of, that order of magnitude of result. Like, for example, if you put on five pounds of muscle in half a year and burned off three pounds of fat, try for the next multiple six month sprints to put on a couple pounds of muscle and burn off a couple pounds of fat. That's realistic, right? Like if you if you threw a punch into one of those punch machines and it said like 600 pounds per square inch, whatever, right? You could be like, Mike, how do I train to get to 900? Same order of magnitude, same scale. I could be like, yeah, that's reasonable, right? But if you're like, how do I punch at 6,000 PSI? I'd be like, dude, are you out of your mind? Like get your robot arm, maybe. Like that's crazy. But some people will kind of get these gains consistently and single digit pounds of fat burned and muscle gains per year. And then they'll come to you and say, I want 15 pounds of fat off my body and I want to gain 10 pounds of muscle. And you're like, but you've been gaining two and three, 10, Jesus Christ, like not a miracle worker. And a lot of times that's when a kind of a more close association with reality kind of discussion has to happen. You know what I mean by that? Like you got to have some realistic goals. Some people be like, look, I'm really not winning in my fitness goals. The good thing is like, what are your goals? Okay, what is your typical rate of gain? Some people have been training very hard, have been stagnant for years. I'm not going to 10x your gains. Like, well, if it's stagnant, technically 10x is zero gain still, right? Let's say they gain a pound of muscle every year and lose a pound of fat. I got nothing for you that's going to take that and go to 15 and 15. But maybe I got something to go to three and four, four and five. Maybe that's more realistic. So worth a conversation there. So if the main thing that holds people back in the gym is consistency, what holds people back outside of the gym? Sleep is a panacea for muscle growth and recovery and performance. Many people don't get enough sleep. Sometimes people get enough, almost everyone gets enough sleep on a monthly or even weekly calendar, because if you didn't, you would just degrade and die like battlefield exhaustion style. But a lot of people will be severely underslept by the end of the work week and they'll spend their weekends catching up on sleep. Now, catching up on sleep works in the sense that it, your body goes back to normal, but it doesn't cancel what happened to you before then. Um, so unfortunately, it, it doesn't get you back any of the muscle growth that you missed out. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's kind of like if you are a kid with the, the whole thing of Halloween candy, and you, you know, you're running really fast and a tree limb cuts your hand and you throw the candy off and run crying to your mom two blocks down, she can heal your hand such that you're fine, but you don't get your candy back because there's something interfered with the candy that it just can't take back. And so catch up sleep works to get you normal again. But if you look back and go, hmm, last six days, I was sleeping four hours a day, I would typically need like seven. 
I gained no muscle and actually gained a little bit of fat. There's nothing we can do to reverse that process uh, and be like, okay, I'm getting that back. Like you, if you sleep 12 hours a night on Saturday, Sunday, you're not going to magically gain the muscle you were supposed to gain that week. It's over. That that time is over. So many people struggle with exactly that sort of situation where during the week they're underslept. And that means any amount of training stimulus and, and diet assistance they use is going to be like not falling on deaf ears, but damn near. One of my colleagues, Menno Henselmans, who's uh, an excellent contributor to the fitness space, he summarized a bit of research on exactly how bad it is sleep loss for muscle gain and fat burning. And like, look, man, I, I don't even, I don't even like talking about it in public because it scares people. It's a lot. It's a big difference. Like you can train hard and eat well and sleep well and gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. And if you still eat well and still train hard just the same, but you get like three hours too little sleep every night for a few nights, by the end of that process on net, you've gained fat and lost muscle. It's not like it just takes your gains and losses and reduces them. It flips them in many cases. That is the thing. I, I like your your eyes widened for that. Well, because I'm like my sleep. Sometimes I'm like inconsistent with sleep. So I'm listening to that. And I'm like, God dang. So like, if you were consulting me and you were a professional bodybuilder, and you told me you were inconsistent with sleep, and it was a private call, and you you called me because you wanted a real talk, and be like, the. F- is wrong with you you're a professional you can't miss sleep that's crazy it's like a finance executive on wall street missing board meetings it's not an option it's a must do and so a lot of people think oh i work out hard i don't get and you know you've you've heard this tone from people before no doubt they're like i work out real hard and i eat real well so my sleep's okay but that's not good enough and it could be the thing holding you back. The other thing is, of course, nutrition outside of the gym. Duh, not enough protein, not enough consistency of protein feedings. People say, I had a great breakfast, and then you know they're just getting to the fun part. But okay, how was lunch? Like, well, dinner was good too. And I'm like, how was lunch? And like, I had a cracker, and then I had to run out to a meeting. <laughs> amazing, amazing. <laughs> so you missed half your days of nutrition because you just didn't think things through. So nutrition's another big one, of course. And last one is total stress burden. If you're running around, chicken like head cut off, meetings and meetings and kids' soccer games and all this stuff, your chronic level of fight or flight hormones like cortisol is real high, and that just really blunts overall daily muscle growth. Whereas if your chronic levels of uh, less fight or flight hormone and you're more parasympathetic dominant, the part of your nervous system lets you recover and adapt and grow, if that's mostly how you feel all day, you'll just get way better results. To put a fine point on it, the Bulgarians, who won a way disproportionate higher number of Olympic medals in weightlifting back in the day, they would put their lifters, especially a few months before the Olympics, into an off-site training camp where they slept a full night's sleep. They trained hard as hell one or two two times a day. All their meals were prepared for them completely nutritiously. And they napped twice a day and usually got two massages per day by a professional massage person. The part you don't read in the magazines is they also had sex workers there to make sure that the gentleman was fairly relieved also several times a day. And that means like it's just paradise. You just all you do is either you are grinding the weights to a pulp or you are relaxing and being fed and have no other concerns in your life. That's how you get the best results. Of course, the rest of us can't do that. We all have day jobs, but you do have a choice and like, do I have to do five extracurricular activities with my kids or can we do two and three? They like it better. I like it better. And then I'm not insane all the time falling behind and everything. And I can actually put my gym and nutrition and sleep into more of a useful situation where I do gain more muscle out of that process. Dr. Mike, this has been very entertaining, educational, and informative. Uh, I think the audience is really going to enjoy this conversation. If they want to learn more about your work, if they want to check out um, your YouTube channel, if they want to follow you on social media, where's the best place to do that? Thank you so much. Uh, this has been awesome. So Renaissance Periodization, actually, technically, we just changed our company name formally, RP Strength on YouTube, just letter R, letter P, strength, all one word, just hit that in the YouTube, and then our channel will come up, my giant ugly face will come up, click on one of our videos, br- browse through a few of them, search some topics that I talk about, and maybe subscribe, and that's where I do most of my talking, and then if you want to buy stuff from us, our website's linked in every single video. My butlers always need more Lamborghinis to take care of, and that's really where your money's going. I just want to be upfront with that <laughs> because uh, it's just that, that's, that's what happens. I love your transparency. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. The audience is really going to enjoy this one, and I appreciate your time. Huge pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. 
If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.